Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors. And today we are doing a little bit on our brain health and the effects of medication and what you need to know. I've got Alexandra Cannon here with me and Victor Ruiz. They are both PharmDs with our TMC Pharmacy. So I want to welcome you here today, Alex and Victor. Thank you for thank you for joining us and really sharing with us about this important topic. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here, and thank you everybody that's joining us. So today, the topic for our presentation will be memory, cognition, and medications. And then once again, I'm Victor, this is Alex. Um, so we'll get started on our presentation here. So just a few objectives to cover with you. So by the end of this presentation, you should be able to understand the difference between memory and cognition, know how certain medications can affect your memory and your cognition, and then what you can do to reduce and or prevent medication side effects. So here's a picture of three beach balls, an apple, and some balloons. So what I'll ask you is um, just try to remember those pictures. I'll look them up for a few seconds, and then I'll ask you about them later. And then no cheating. Don't write them down. Just make a mental note of them, and then we'll revisit to see um, if you can remember what the images were. And then, again, just a reminder, don't write them down. We'll ask you about them later. So then just to touch base on what is memory. So memory, um, per definition, is like it's a process of storing and remembering information. So our memory, most people think about it as um, something that's a part of us. It helps us um, with thinking and making decisions. But it also um, is important because it makes us who we are. Without memory, we wouldn't have a sense of self, a sense of what's important to us. And a lot of people don't see memory as something that's unique to them, which it is. Um, so just as stated there, it does provide us with a sense of self and makes up for continual experiences of life. And what I mean by that is everybody has memories of what they do with their families, their loved ones, or unique experiences that have made you who you are today. So memory is just more than remembering things or how well you are at memorizing certain topics. It's more than that. It's about how everything you remember, everything that's happened to you, everything that you hold in that brain of yours makes you who you are today. And then there's the other component of it, which is cognition. So cognition refers to gaining knowledge and comprehension. So here we'll look at, OK, what is the information that you're learning, information that you're retaining? Um, and then there's different types of processes. So you think of them as maybe things you do on the daily and don't even realize that this is part of your cognition. And some of it would be such as breathing, even though you're not thinking about it, it's part of your cognition. Your body remembers that you need to breathe, you need to eat, you need to drink, um, you need to walk, you need to move. So, and usually it's divided into different categories not to go so much into detail, but it's divided into like attention, language, learning, memory. So it's practically your perception and thought of not just what you're doing at the time, but also the world. And that's part of cognition, which also plays a part of memory. But the cognitive side is more about how is it that you're perceiving the world outside and taking in that information and processing it. So here's just a little cartoon about young individuals and i feel like most people can relate to this where it's like oh like i feel like i'm forgetting something today what is it that i'm forgetting and then you're like i'll remember later and then either that same day or it could be days it could be weeks and then you're like oh yeah i forgot to grab this but this is just to also emphasize the fact that it's not most people put like oh you start forgetting things at a certain age or as we age, but that's not true. Um, even as whether we're young, whether you're mid-age, or call it whatever you want to call it, we all forget things from time to time, and that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with our memory. Um, obviously, if you're forgetting things on the daily and then you're worried about it, then yes, that's something to talk to your provider about. 
but just keep in mind that just because you forget things here and there doesn't really define um, or it's an aspect of you being old or you forgetting things or you not able to retain information. No, it happens to all of us. It's all a matter of what you're doing at the time and what's really important to you that you're trying to remember, right? You'll remember the more important things, but things that you're like, I can do this later, those are the things you kind of tend to forget about. So just wanted to emphasize that with this nice little cartoon that we all forget things. Now, moving on into the meat of our topic is, so certain medications can affect your cognition and memory. So one of the sections or one of the medications most of you would be more familiar with would be over-the-counter medications, herbal products, and then there's also prescription drug medications. So I'll touch on a few of these. Um, and then this is just a list of high risk medications. Um, usually as pharmacists, or if you ever talk to your pharmacist or doctor, they'll name a few of this one. So such drugs like anticholinergics, first generation antihistamines, benzodiazepines, sedative hypnotics or antiemetics, and then the ones in black too as well. But then I also think about you as a patient that sometimes you might be like, what is all of this? Especially if you're not familiar with it, right? So those are certain class of medications and they can range from over-the-counter to prescription drug medications. So I'll touch on a few over-the-counter medications that can affect your memory and cognition um, that you may not be aware of or are aware of, but just don't really think about it. So over-the-counter products. So they're designed to be taken safely without a prescription from your doctor. They are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, one of the things that I usually recommend as a pharmacist, especially in the community setting, is if you're looking for a medication to treat whatever symptoms you have going on, but you're also taking prescription medications, rule of thumb, if you're not sure how that's going to interact with your medications, talk to your pharmacist, because they can still there's still potential for interactions that can affect either your memory, your cognition, or in other ways. Or if not, you can always talk to your doctor um, and they can give you some information of whether or not certain over-the-counter medications would be okay to take. But always double check. Don't assume that it'll be fine to take, especially if you're on multiple prescription drugs. So one of the over-the-counter medications that's commonly sought out for and bought would be Benadryl. So usually it's used for allergies, some people use it to sleep or they're having some sort of allergic reaction. But some of the common side effects of Benadryl is confusion, dry mouth, and constipation. And especially as we age, that becomes really important because if you become disoriented, um, there's chances for you to get hurt. Um, there's also the constipation side of things as we age, um, sometimes are GI system doesn't work as well or gets things moving as well. And being constipated can really be really uncomfortable. It can also be really bad. Um, and sometimes if prolonged can lead to hospitalization and that's just some things that people don't think about. But a simple drug like Benadryl, you might think, oh, it's not gonna do much to me. But if you're taking it and you have and interacts with other medications, and you already have other conditions that you probably don't think would be affected by this medication, then it becomes an issue. So that's just one of the medicines to think about. The other one that I wanted to bring up is Dramamine. So a lot of people know this or use this for motion sickness. And again, it has the same effects as Benadryl. So it can have, it can cause confusion, a dry mouth, constipation, and then again, some people might use it as well for allergies or sleep because it will make you drowsy as well. But most commonly set out for, for motion sickness, but just keeping in mind, um, it can have those side effects and interact with other medications that you're taking. So here's just an example of other medications that you might see over the counter. So Unisum is one of them. So most people, know that unisums for sleep, but again, it does have the side effect where it can cause confusion, can affect your memory and cognition, dry mouth constipation. Bonine is meclisine, which would be, um, again, anti-nausea, anti-vertigo, same side effects. And then antihistamines that are over the counter, such as the chlorpheniramine or chlortab, some people buy those. 
Um, this one has the potential to, again, cause confusion, dry mouth, constipation, can also make you drowsy. So it can definitely have some undesired side effects that you probably don't want, especially if you're taking other medications. But just keeping in mind um, that these agents are out there. So I guess the driving point for this is also looking before you even pick up anything, what the drug is. And if unsure of what it is, just ask. That way um, you know how it can potentially impact you or you can also ask those questions before you even decide to take anything. And then here's just a question for you guys um, out there listening. So you have two products here, again, commonly bought, set out for in the community in your regular Walgreens or CVS. So what is similar between these two over-the-counter products? And then you got whoever's joined us can put it in the chat. Um, see if you can catch what the main difference, what the main similarity or difference is as well. I'll give you just a couple seconds. So just for time's sakes, I guess. Um, so usually these two products, you wouldn't, if, like without just looking at them, you're just looking at the brand and you're like, okay, Sequel is for sleep and Tylenol is for pain. But two of the, both of these agents have diphenhydramine, which I've highlighted here. So if we go back to diphenhydramine, it's Benadryl. Um, so these two medications have that potential of affecting or causing you to have confusion, dry mouth, constipation, as well as other side effects that you're probably not aware of um, and can have, again, potential interactions with some of your medications. But just as an example of medicines that are commonly bought over the counter, but you may not be kind of thinking about, okay, what's in this product, really? So like Tylenol PM, combination of acetaminophen, Benadryl, and then just Sequel, which is just plain Benadryl. So then now digging into um, more of the dietary and herbal supplements. So herbal supplements are derived from plants and or oils, root seeds, berries, flowers. So they're more natural, organic, as you want to call it. Um, they'll usually state how it can help. Like for example, this is for immune health. This is for cardiovascular health, um, but it can't claim it treats a disease or illness. Um, dietary supplements, though, on the other hand, are intended to supplement micronutrients such as amino acids, vitamins, enzymes, etc. But they're also not intended to treat, diagnose, or cure or alleviate any type of disease. So I just want to make that clear that even though some of these products might say they can help boost immune system or help with your cardiovascular health, doesn't mean that they're treating any specific type of disease or illness. So for the most part, dietary herbal supplements are not regulated by the FDA. As always, same driving point with the over-the-counter medications applies to dietary herbal supplements. Always ask your pharmacist before deciding or to buy them or even initiate any supplement, especially if you're taking multiple medications that are prescribed by your doctor, as they can still have significant over-the-drug-to-drug um, -drug interactions and can possibly affect your thinking and also have, like mentioned, undesirable side effects. And then always inform your doctor of what other over-the-counter herbal supplements, dietary supplements you've been taking that they might may not be aware of because that's something that they could or should potentially know, especially when they're thinking about how to further help you control whatever disease they, they're, they're helping you with. So just for a few examples, it's like some of the common dietary herbal supplements that you hear out there or people buy would be like ginkgo, green tea, ginger, grapeseed, ginseng, and there's many others out there. But again, driving the point that they may put you at risk for drug adverse effects and can have potential drug to drug interactions with your prescribed medications. So here's just a few pictures of them. Um, so this is common pictures of supplements that you see out there that people, again, commonly buy. So if you're 
taking prescription medications, what are some things to think about before buying a dietary herbal supplement? Is the first question to you all listening out there, as well as who, sh who should you talk to about any of the supplements that I have on the screen? Um, before you even decide to buy them, what are things that you want to know? Uh, or are you just going to buy it and take it? So it'd be interesting to see what your opinions are, what your take is um, when looking at this product. You're like, oh, I'm going to buy that for whatever the reason is. So again, if you're joining us, just put it in the chat. Um, and then I'll give you a couple uh, seconds and then we'll move forward in just a little bit. So I'll go ahead and move forward. So the key point in this question was always, so things you want to ask before initiating any supplement or herbal product is what are the drug interactions? Um, how are they going to interact with whatever over prescription medications I'm taking or other, they could even interact with other supplements or with the counter medications that you're taking. What are the risks involved, right, in taking such products, such as Prevagen, for example, um, plus my other medications that I'm taking. And then really important to talk to your pharmacist or doctor um, even before deciding to start any supplements, any herbal products, um, just to make sure that they're safe for you and that they're not going to adversely affect you. Because again, all, some of these drugs have that potential to affect your memory, your cognition, and can make you feel sick as well. So we don't want any of that. So uh, the next topic will be presented by my co-resident, Alex, um, and then she'll take over from here. So hi, everyone. Just to introduce myself again, my name is Alex, and I'm a pharmacy resident here at TMC. Uh, my portion of the presentation is just going to be talking about some of our prescription medications that we as pharmacists just pay a little bit more attention to when patients present on them. So first I'm just gonna briefly talk about what is a prescription medication. So these are prescribed by a doctor and they are intended to be used by only one person. So I think sometimes, you know, if we run out of medication or a family member or a friend has a medication that they're using for an issue and you have the same issue, it might be easy to take a pill or just try something, but it's really important that that prescription is just for that one patient. Um, that doctor and that patient have a relationship and so they understand what the needs are and what that person's needs might not be the same as your needs. So just make sure that you are taking what was prescribed to you by your doctor. These prescription medications are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, so the FDA, as well as our over-the-counter products. And then again, I think as you listen to this presentation, you'll understand that the take-home point is really to talk to your doctor and your pharmacist about all of the prescription medications that you are currently taking as well as what Victor is saying about the herbal supplements and over-the-counter. So I'm just going to talk about these four medication classes, but there are definitely other high-risk prescription medications that we look at as pharmacists and that we look at and discuss with physicians. But the four that I'll be talking about our tricyclic antidepressants, our benzodiazepines, our sedative hypnotics, and then skeletal muscle relaxants. So the first class that we'll talk about are our tricyclic antidepressants. So there definitely are a lot of different medications in this class but I just picked the three that I'll mention because these are the most common that I see prescribed by physicians. So we have amitriptyline, which is Elevil. 
We have Doxepin, which the brand name is Silenor, and Imipramin, which is Tofranil. So again, these are commonly used for depression and or sleep. They are prescribed for both. And then in terms of the common side effects, we have sedation, confusion, and constipation. So again, I just want you to focus on the red because that's really what is going to affect your memory and your cognition. So sedation and confusion are really what we're concerned about with these side effects. And I do just want to preface this with when we do talk about these side effects, they don't happen to everyone, but they are just what is most commonly reported. So you might take these medications and maybe you don't have any of these side effects, but if the physician is going to start you on a medication, it's good to know that it can cause sedation and or confusion, which is really what we're concerned about with this medication. The next class that I'll talk about are our benzodiazepines. So again, I just picked the four most common benzodiazepines that I see, but if you are on any medication that ends in like that AM or PAM, that's usually an indication that it's a benzodiazepine. So the first one I have up there is Alprazolam, which is our Xanax. We also have Lorazepam, which is Ativan, Clonazepam, which is Clonapin, and Temazepam, which is Restoril. So benzodiazepines can be used for many different disease states and they have a lot of indications, but they're most commonly used for anxiety, for seizures, and also for sleep. So when we talk about the common side effects, as you can see, all of the side effects are red, which is what we want to focus on, right? So again, our benzodiazepines can cause sedation they can actually impair our memory and cognition. So you might just not be able to remember after you take this medication. Also can cause confusion and delirium. And then it also can cause dizziness. And with medications that cause dizziness, we really want to monitor those because if someone were to become dizzy, then that could lead to a fall, which we absolutely do not want anyone to fall while being on the medication. So it's really important with these medications, these benzodiazepines, as well as the other ones that we'll talk about, that if you are starting them as a new medication, you should take your first dose at home. So you don't wanna take your dose right before you start driving or going for a walk until you know exactly how it's going to affect you. Um, as I said, these are just side effects. They're common, but doesn't mean that they happen. But if you do happen to get sedated from these and you try to drive or you try to walk or you try to do some type of activity, it's not really the best. So with any new medication, the recommendation would be to just take your first dose at home before you know how it's actually going to affect you. The next class that we'll talk about are sedative hypnotics. So we have esoplicone, which is also called Lunesta. Uh, we have Zolpidem, which is the brand name Ambien. And then Zaliplon, which is our brand name Sonata. So this medication, or this class of medications, are commonly used for insomnia, which is just also a trouble of falling asleep or staying asleep or you know, maintaining a restful sleep. And the common side effects with these class are drowsiness, um, amnesia, which is the inability to remember events for a period of time, as well as confusion, and then abnormal dreams. Um, so really, you know, again, the drowsiness and the confusion are what we look for. Um, also the amnesia, there have been reports of something as you know someone waking and having a conversation with someone and not remembering to some reports of someone actually like sleepwalking eating um, even driving and not remembering it the next day 
So it can be pretty serious with the amnesia. So it's it's important again that you take this medication, you know, the way it's intended to be taken. You take it right before you're getting ready to go to bed, and you take it at home. Um, the that side effect of amnesia is not. I'm not telling you to scare you, but I just want you to know so that if it does happen, that you can take it to your doctor and maybe this medication might not be the best medication for you if you're experiencing that side effect of just not remembering anything that happened after you took it. And then the last class that I'll talk about is the skeletal muscle relaxants. So again, this class, there's a lot of different medications in this class, but I just picked the most common ones that I have seen. So Carisoprodol or Soma is the brand name. We also have Cyclobenzaprine, which is Flexeril, and then Methylcarbamol, which is Robaxin. These are commonly used for muscle pain as well as muscle spasms. And again, you can see the side effect, dizziness and drowsiness, as well as confusion. And then it can cause dry mouth. But really, the ones that are bolded in red are the ones that we really wanna focus on because that is what is going to affect our memory and our cognition. Um, and then I just have a little cartoon up there. So the physician is in the white coat and the patient is in the chair, but it says, well, first I think we'll cut back on those muscle relaxants. So it's just a little funny cartoon, but it can cause drowsiness. It can cause confusion. And so it's just important to be aware of those side effects before you start a new medication. And then again, if you just want to take a few seconds to kind of think about this question, um, if you want to put it in the comment section, you're more than welcome. But what do you think that you can do to help reduce medication side effects? And then I'll just leave this up here if you just want to take a few seconds just to personally think about what you would do to help yourself so that you don't experience so many different side effects. And then we'll talk about it on the next slide. Okay, so hopefully you were able to think about the question. Um, here are just some recommendations I have, but of course there's more than just this. Um, the first one I have up there is try to take as few drugs as possible. Um, I know this is hard, especially if you have different physicians like cardiologists, an endocrinologists, then you have your primary. But the more drugs that we take, the more risk we are at having some type of drug-drug interaction that can cause a side effect that we don't want. Uh, one recommendation I can make is if there is a non-medication technique before starting a medication that you can try that. Um, for example, you know, hypertension, maybe with diet and exercise, um, or if you know you are having trouble falling asleep there are some non-medication techniques that the pharmacist or your physician should be going over with you just about you know not having distractions not having the tv on and to try those first and then of course if that does not work and you do need some type of medication then that would be the appropriate time to be put on a medication but if we can do anything to help mitigate the number of medications you're on, that would definitely help. Um, again, I think you know the take home point of this presentation is to review your medications regularly with your doctor and your pharmacist. Um, it's, it's a good idea to have a list of your medications and then keep them up to date. 
I don't know if every pharmacy or physician's office has it, but you can find a medication card where you can write the name of the medication, the dose that you're taking, like how often you're taking it and what you're taking it for. And then that's just a good reminder too for you to know what medications you're on. Um, I know for Victor and I being in the hospital setting, those are really handy so that if you were ever, you know, hopefully we never see you in the emergency department, but if you were to come into the emergency department, if you had your list of medications, we as pharmacists would review that. And then we'd also would make sure that they got ordered for you if you were admitted. So it's really important for your physician as well as the pharmacist to know what you're taking. Uh, also, again, talk to your doctor or pharmacist about any interactions before starting a new prescription or over-the-counter medication. Uh, in an ideal world, it would be really nice if everyone shared one medical record and we could just pull up all the information about you that everyone else, like your primary care doctor or cardiologist knows, but unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. So if your cardiologist prescribed you a medication, your primary care doctor might not know that they actually prescribed that. And so sometimes when that happens, we can get duplicate medications. So you might be on two medications prescribed by two different physicians. So again, that's why it's important kind of going back to review your medications and keep an updated medication list and then review that with the pharmacist or the doctor. And then the last point I have is just trying to avoid a prescribing cascade. And what I mean by prescribing cascade is we're prescribing a drug to treat a side effect of another drug. So as we went through this presentation, a lot of the side effects that you can see were confusion, um, but that could be a side effect of the medication not just you actually being confused. So if you went to your doctor and you said, you know, I'm having a lot of confusion, they might prescribe a medication to treat that confusion when all we really needed to do was maybe decrease the dose of that other medication or try a different medication within the same class of medications. So this is just kind of a pattern of prescribing to treat a side effect, which we don't want to do because then you're going to be on a lot of medications. So it is 100% appropriate to ask your provider or even the pharmacist, could this problem I'm having be due to a drug I'm taking? And if the physician doesn't know, the pharmacist should know the side effects and they would be able to help as well. And then I'm just going to talk about ways to help improve memory, which again, this is by no means an inclusive list. It's just some points and some things we could do, but there's definitely other ways we can help to improve our memory. So the first one would just be include physical activity in our daily routines. Um, this just gets you know our blood pumping, blood to the brain, blood just everywhere, which is what we want. Um, also, staying mentally active, whether that's reading or, you know, playing games, however you want to stay mentally active. Also, socializing regularly. It's, you know, it's good to have friends. It's good to go out and have good conversations, talk to other people, just hear kind of what they're saying. Um, get organized. I know for me, if my desk at work is a complete mess with papers just all over, I tend to forget where I put certain things and then, you know, I get stressed about it. So if your house or your desk or wherever you're at is well organized, then that will help to improve your memory of where you left something or where you need to find something. And also just sleeping well. You know, when you are when you sleep well, your brain is rested, you feel rested, and that can also help to improve that memory. 
And then again, here are just some ways to help improve cognition. Again, I'm just gonna say this is not, you know, an inclusive list. You don't have to do everything on this list. It's just some ways to kind of help help you. Um, so the first one is to just meditate. Uh, by all means, do you have to meditate like that picture I put in there? Uh, meditation can just be, you know, sitting by yourself for five minutes and just thinking about, you know, how your day went or thinking about, you know, the positives or, you know, what you want to do tomorrow. So, you know, you don't have to sit on the ground and cross your legs, but meditation can help. Uh, playing memory card games. Also, if you have crossword or jigsaw puzzles, as well as Sudoku. I know they make uh, like actual books of the crossword, jigsaw, and Sudoku. Um, if you are savvy with a smartphone, they also have apps that you can download and play these games. Um, also, just playing chess can help with your cognition. And then listening to your favorite kind of music is also another way that you can just help kind of boost that cognition. So I will leave this up here for a few seconds. Again, you can comment in the chat or if you just want to kind of test yourself. But if we're thinking back to the very beginning, do you remember what those three images were that we showed you? And I'll just leave it up for a few seconds if you just want to test yourself or you can leave it in the chat. and then I will move to the next slide. So hopefully you were able to remember. So we had our three beach balls, an apple, and some balloons. Um, good job if you got all three. And then just to kind of summarize this presentation, so it's really important that you can learn all that you can about your medication. So whether they be over the counter, the dietary or herbal or prescriptions, it's really important for you to also know, you know, the benefit. What benefit are you getting out of this medication as well as the risks? By risks, it's more talking about the side effects, which, you know, we covered, as well as that the drug interactions. Um, you should know how your medications affect you, and this goes Back to my point on, you know, any new medication, I would recommend taking that first dose at home before you know exactly how it's going to affect you. Uh, also, you know, kind of the take home, drive home point we want is it's okay to ask questions. We would really rather you ask a question if you're uncertain about anything than just take a medication and, you know, because you're afraid to ask for anything. Um, pharmacists are at the counter and they are accessible for a reason. Your physician as well, you know, I would rather you call the physician's office if you can't talk to a pharmacist. But again, ask questions and ask a lot of questions. Uh, also, talk to your pharmacist and your physician about any drug-to-drug -drug interactions. When you have these drug-to-drug -drug interactions, they can cause these side effects, which is what we're trying to avoid. And then again, it's really important to discuss any changes with your doctor. So like I said, sometimes the physicians don't always communicate. So if you have, you know, different physicians from different specialties, like a heart doctor or, you know, a diabetes doctor and your primary care, they might not be talking to each other and saying what medications that they prescribed you. And sometimes they might prescribe the same medication. So it's important that you talk to all of them about any new medications, any changes that you made to your diet, and any symptoms or side effects that you might be having when you started this new medication, or just in general. Um, so really ask, ask, ask. Uh, pharmacists are really readily accessible in the community setting. 
So we would rather you ask than take something that could potentially hurt you in any type of way. And so with that, that is our presentation. So we'll now open it up for any questions that you guys have for us. Thank you so much, um, Alex and Victor. That was a great overview of so many different medications and herbal supplements in particular, uh, it, you know, as well. I have, I have somebody who did comment about that he was diagnosed with drug-induced Parkinsonian Parkinsonian Parkinsonism <laughs> and has a lot of um, other comorbidities. Um, is there, you know, somebody that may be on several, has been prescribed several medications, is it really, it sounds like they really should maybe speak with their physician and their pharmacist and maybe have a whole um, sort of reconciliation of their, of, of what they're taking? So, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for the, for asking Chuck, but yes, if you're on 20 plus medication like you're describing, and the concern is that whatever the medications or medication is causing some sort of drug induced heart Parkinson's system, yeah. um, my recommendation to you would be to, if you have all your medications on the list, um, to take that to your pharmacist or even your provider so that they can screen the medications that you're on, see what classes they are, looking to see what side of it. Certainly, there are medications out there that can cause um, Parkinson's try symptoms so like you know tremors um shakiness um but it'll be in this case it'd be really important for you to just take that list and have them do a medication reconciliation because sometimes what i see in patients that are having especially symptoms like this is that they might be on medications that are or have the same mechanism of action um and really that's just adding to your side effects and, which is why you might be feeling them now or it could be a medication that for some reason you are on it, but you might not even need it. I would say my recommendation to you, just without knowing what those drugs are, because obviously you're mentioning it seems like quite a hefty a load of them, just take it to your pharmacist. Again, pharmacists are more accessible because I know with doctors you would have to call the office, maybe set up an appointment. But if you have the time and if you have a pharmacy that you go to and fill prescriptions and you trust your pharmacist there, um, which I hope is the case, just take them your medication list and ask them if they can do a medication reconciliation with you and see what medications you're on for what. They will ask you specific questions um, as far as like your disease states, what are you taking each medication for? But that will also help them guide them to see like, okay, which medications you really need to be on and which medications they can talk to your doctor about possibly either reducing the dose, discontinuing, or even offering other alternatives. So I hope that helps with what you're asking. And, and I know sometimes folks tend to use different pharmacies, right? So they might get something filled at one place, but they may go someplace else for another. So it's really important that people know everything, you know, that the pharmacist knows everything that you're on in order to do that reconciliation. Yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I, like I said, I think in an ideal world, it would be so nice if all of our systems were hooked up together to where we could pull in information, uh, especially, like you said, Chuck, for 20 plus medications and if some medications you have to get you know, mail to you, but others you pick up at CVS, like it can get really confusing. So unfortunately, we don't have that yet. Hopefully in the future we have it, because that would be so nice. But it's great that you have an Excel spreadsheet and you know, hopefully it's you're keeping it up to date. But like Victor said, um, the pharmacist is trained to do medication reconciliations and they would be able to help you in deciding what medications you absolutely have to be on and which um i, mean, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the herbal supplements because i know you mentioned um victor i know you mentioned prevagen at one point um 
Mm -hmm. Looks like Kevin Jim maybe has a lot of vitamin D in it. Could you be take? I mean, uh, your physician might be telling you you should take vitamin D, but then you're also taking Prevagen. So you could be doing a lot more than maybe what you need, right? And I, I know Prevagen has other things. That's just, just a slight example of what I'm referring to. So could you be doing, could you be overdoing it by taking, you know, multiple types of different supplements that um, aren't really maybe necessary? I'm not sure. I'm just asking. Usually what I, um, what I tell my patients, especially like out in the community, because for example, the Prevagen, that one's a really great example because that medication or supplement, I should say, is usually advertised a whole lot with the notion that it can help improve memory, it can help improve cognition. So obviously the buyer just wants to go and try it out and see if they'll help, especially if they notice they're having like cognition or memory problems. But the thing with that is, like specifically Prevagen, um, it has other ingredients in there, um, especially if you look at the active ingredients, you might just say one, but there's a lot of, you know, inactive ingredients, um, additional stuff to kind of keep everything together that the patient might not need. So in the example of the vitamin D per se, if a patient is deficient in vitamin D, I'd rather that if the only thing that they're lacking is vitamin D, just get the vitamin D because with vitamin D, it is a fatty vitamin. So there is potential for overdose on vitamins and can have other side effects, which can lead to hospitalization. But just per se, for example, like with the Prevagen, a lot of people might not be aware that it does have side effects. So just irregular heartbeat can cause hypertension, nausea, dizziness, headaches. But of course, these are things that are not um, told to the patient when buying this type of products for another reason or another, but that's why it's important to talk to the pharmacist about what would be best, especially if you don't know, like, okay, I might be deficient in X, Y, C, vitamins. What can I take that's not, um, that's still safe, but it's not gonna add to what they call like, my pill burden, right? Especially if you're already on multiple medications. And then overall, just making sure that what you're taking is safe in the long run. I think that's the key driving point with any of these supplement herbs and even oh, prescription medications, unfortunately. And if you're on a prescription medication um, that has some of these side effects that, that you discussed maybe about confusion, does if you are on that for a longer period of time, does that, does that wane at all or does it always leave you in that sort of in that state? So yeah, I think it depends on the medication because um, some of these medications, like for example, the benzodiazepines, you can, you know, like build up a tolerance to them. And so over time, those side effects might, you know, dwindle. But because the medications that I discussed, and there are a lot, they always have that potential to cross into the brain. And so there's always going to be that risk of the dizziness or the drowsiness or the confusion. So while it might slowly go away over time, you know, in the beginning, it might be unbearable at times if, you know, you're constantly confused that we might just want to try a different medication. But it, it can happen at any time because there's always that potential to go into the brain, which then, you know, it can affect like what we talked about. And, and, and obviously, if you're taking more than one of those, then you're going to be, you know, even more hindered. Um, right. Your confusion or, or, you know, whatever those side effects are. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you both for being here today. This was a great talk. Um, you covered a lot of material, all, everything that's really important for people to know about their medications. So thank you for being here, and we hope to see everybody again at our next presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was great.